Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mike Dietrich. I'm the Vice President of Product Marketing here at Cvent, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, the 2024 Event Trends. Now, before we get started, of all the webinars we do, and we do a lot, this is my favorite one. Um, this is kind of our annual reveal of what's on your mind, what we see in our systems that help us all collectively, hopefully better plan for 2024. So before we get started, a quick note on how these trends come together. Uh, first, our event marketing and management platform powered over 300,000 events last year in 2023. And so a lot of what you'll see is informed by the types of events and the types of engagement that we see coming through our systems on an annual basis. Also in the mix is our customers. Uh, we have over 21,000 customers across the globe and we hear from them constantly about what they're thinking, what they're doing, how they're changing to be more impactful. Uh, and then our teams, we listen to our teams. Uh, we have over 1,400 customer facing folks here at Cvent and they spend collectively hundreds of thousands of hours talking with, talking with customers, talking with prospects. And so we put all that together to hopefully give us a pretty good pulse about what's going on in the industry and how people are approaching 2024. So to take us through those, um, let me introduce you quickly to uh, my partners in crime today. Um, again, my name's Mike Dietrich. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Cvent, but joining me today to go through these trends will be Alex Plotia. Uh, Alex is our Director of Product Marketing and is kind of here with me at Cvent's headquarters right outside of Washington, DC. Uh, this is gonna be a global show too. So Victoria Axinoan is also joining us. Um, and Victoria is out of our London office. So uh, Alex and Victoria, thank you for joining us. We're gonna be coming to you shortly. Okay, before we get started, a couple quick housekeeping items. The content part of this is gonna be about 40 minutes. We're gonna share about 40 minutes of insights, what we're seeing, and then we'd love to hear your questions. We're gonna spend the rest of the time making sure we hear from you and answering any questions you have. Um, a few other quick things to be in as, as interactive as possible. On the right side of your screen, you can join the chat and submit questions in the Q&A and we'll address those at the end of the webinar. And please feel free to upvote any existing questions you see in Q&A. That'll help us make sure we're answering the questions that are most top of mind for you. Um, you'll also be receiving a follow-up email with a link to the recording. And so you can always access that recording anytime by just logging into Cvent Webinar like you did here and just click the watch recording button. And you'll find the PowerPoint for this presentation that we'll be discussing and other related materials under the resources on your right. Okay, so with that, let's get to our first trend. Before we do, I wanna flip the script a little bit. Before we share what we're seeing with respect to 2024 events and how they're shaping up, I'd like to hear from you. What are your meeting and event programs looking like in 2024? Are they in-person only? Are they more of a mix of mostly in-person with a little bit of virtual thrown in? Maybe they're 50-50, which is answer C, half in-person, half virtual. And then we'd also like to hear from those of you uh, an answer D, we're primarily virtual with a little bit of in-person thrown in. So before I share with you what the systems and what the data says from our side, love to hear from you all. We're giving this a few more minutes to Mostly in person, a little bit of virtual and in person only, very, very strongly. Okay. Fantastic. Well, those of you that are joining us today, you look a lot like what our systems tell us, which leads us to the first trend that as we look at next year, in person absolutely dominates, virtual remains a significant part of the mix. Let me show you a couple pieces of data that our systems tell us and that we see in the marketplace. Um, let me start on the left side. Uh, on the left side are the actual number of events that came through Cvent's system last year. About 70% of those were in person, about 25% 25 of those events were virtual, 
and about 5% of those were hybrid. Now, this is what actually happened in the system last year. Every year, we also ask our customers what they're planning to do next year. We reach, we reach out to those 21,000 customers, say, what are you looking at next year? And that top circle on the right is what they told us they were doing next year. 74% in-person only, a little 16% virtual, so the virtual element shrinking a little bit, and 10% hybrid. And then down at the bottom, wanted to also share another interesting data source. The folks at Amex Globe will do a wonderful job of also looking at this space. And so I selected a piece of research that they did that also show that when you look at the in-person and the hybrid together, 79% or so have in-person components. So the data is actually pretty clear on this point that in-person is gonna dominate, virtual is gonna sit there at about 20 to 25% of the mix next year. And so the implication that we see is that organizations like in 2023 are gonna see their customers and prospects in all kinds of events in event formats next year. And so the teams and the tech are gonna to have to continue to run all kinds and be ready for all of them. So that's our first trend. To kick us off into trend two, Alex, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Thanks, Mike. So for the second trend, venues are supporting experience first events. So imagine a corporate meeting invite that really sparks that excitement when an attendee registers. That's exactly what planners are looking for. Instead of that location being a typical ballroom, you're looking for a venue that can offer those unique experiences. Meetings like this can have lower attrition and ultimately they can wow your customers. So first, while planner bookings are up in general, it's not just for those traditional venue types like a hotel. It's really for the special event venues as well. Planners are looking for venues that can help maximize their event experience. And there's really four core reasons why these planners are seeking out these special event venues. The first is cost control. The second being flexible event spaces. The third aesthetics. And then lastly, outdoor spaces. So let's jump in. Budget is always gonna be at the top of a planner's concerns and keeping events cost effective, it's imperative. Planners, you're acutely aware of how much each aspect of an event costs because you just can't overpay. And these unique venues, these special event venues, they offer that breath of fresh air because corporate events, you know, they're not often the primary source of income for these unique venues. So these venues can be more flexible with their pricing models, especially since the demand isn't as high as it is for those traditional venue types. Other factors, you know, they might have built in ambience, decoration, et cetera. This can help cut down on those costs substantially since they don't have to fill it, say an empty ballroom. For flexible spaces, planners wanna know what the venue can be transformed or how that venue can be transformed to suit their needs and their preferences. Traditional venues are often cookie cutter, right? With options, but because of corporate rules and regulations, non-compete with preferred venues, Special event venues, they can really offer that more personalized approach, making sure that you're able to bring your own favorite vendors and then ultimately helping you meet your needs. And then lastly, aesthetics and outdoor spaces, right? Did you know the average millennial spends about two and a half hours daily on social media? It's really no surprise as planners are looking for select locations that are primed for that social sharing. From an outdoor patio on a golf course to the view from the the field or even a stadium, right? Your guests are gonna be drawn to these unique, incredible, one-of-a-kind experiences. And now I'll go ahead and pass it over to Victoria, who's gonna cover our next trend. Thanks so much, Alex. So um, before we get to that, one of the fun things we did ahead of this webinar is ask people in the industry for their 2024 predictions. Um, and this trend is all about AI. So up first, we have Alistair Turner, who is the Managing Director at 8PR and Marketing and the author of the 2024 IBTM World Trends Report. So let's see what he had to say. Hello, my name is Alistair Turner. I'm author of the 2024 IBTM World Trends Report. And my one of my many trends for 2024 is around AI. So for me, artificial intelligence will break down into the three A's for 2024, accessibility, automation, and augmentation. Automation is essentially about making planners' lives easier by taking the increased complexities and pain points of the role and removing them. Augmentation is about taking a physical event and layering on AI-powered digital elements that improve and enhance the experience. 
Finally, accessibility means using technology to improve the inclusivity of your event through features such as multiple language translation, sensory aids, and digital signage and reputation. Anyway, those are my trends for 2024 around AI specifically. Um, I hope you enjoy the report and there's many more available. Yeah, so of course we couldn't have a webinar about trends without talking about AI. Um, but before we dive in, I'm really curious to know if any of you watching are already using AI in your event planning or marketing. Um, there is a poll that should be coming up now. Um, and really curious to, to, to know if, you know, yes, you know, you are using AI already. Um, no, um, you're not. Or maybe you're not yet and, and you're planning to. Um, and perhaps if you are, you can drop, you know, a message in the chat to say how you're using it currently. If you're not, you know, why not? Um, and if you're planning to, um, you know, what are some of the things that you're looking to, to use AI for? It'd be really interesting to, to know. So, oh, this is quite surprising. So it's very um, evenly spread um, at the moment. So most of you, about 40% are saying no, um, you're not using AI. Um, and then 30%, it's split 30, 30 actually. Yes, um, you are and no, you're, you're planning to. Um, I think this is a really interesting insight actually, because um, whilst it feels like everyone is talking about AI, you know, chat GPT really did take the world by storm last year um, and showed the potential of generative AI to, you know, transform the way we work. I think that as an industry, we're still really at the, the early stage, you know, of that AI journey. So really this year, this trend is all about um, event planners and marketers continuing to experiment with um, ways to use AI tools potentially. Um, and if we take a look at, you know, some of the numbers, um, you know, AI isn't a fad, it is here to stay. Um, across industries, most global executives um, agree that it's going to play an important role in their organizations in the next few years. Um, and we see that there are benefits when it comes to increasing productivity um, and streamlining job processes. And AI can really help to, to speed up some of those time consuming and tedious tasks. Um, but let's take a quick look at some of the ways um, planners and marketers are already starting to use AI. So here um, we have, you know, idea generating ideas. Um, AI is, is a great tool to spark creativity and come up with new ideas for your events. You know, that could be using AI to brainstorm new session formats or themes, for example. Um, when it comes to content creation, I think that's something that many of us might be um, familiar with. But what's great about that is you can use generative AI specifically to create content for, you know, your website or for email and social media campaigns. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to if you've already got that content, what I love to do is, is use AI to get feedback on, on whether that content really resonates. Um, and then when it comes to things like, you know, data analysis, you know, in the video, Alistair talked about augmentation. So using AI to really enhance that event experience. Um, but you first need to understand what your attendees want. So one way AI can help is to analyze feedback surveys. So plugging that information into, into your tool, making sure it's anonymous, of course, but asking it to analyze patterns in attendee responses. And you can really build on this to drill down and understand understand your attendees' preferences um, and get new insights, you know, as to how you can improve future events. Um, there are many more use cases um, and the opportunities are, are really endless at this point, but um, I'm aware that, you know, a lot of um, you watching aren't necessarily using AI um, at this stage. But I think what's important um, to recognize is it is, um, it is a tool and it's it's a tool that's not going to go away. It's a tool that can really benefit you um, as you as you um, are working on different tasks. It can really help to ensure that you're more efficient and really automate some of those more time consuming processes. Um, but I will end by saying I think um, there are concerns, you know, around AI. There are questions around ethics, data privacy, job security. You know, those are valid, and those might be some of the reasons why um, um, some organizations aren't using AI right now, um, but 
I will end by saying like, you know, it's not it's not going away anytime soon. And um, it's probably best to start experimenting with it um, and really making sure that um, you're you're not left behind um, when it comes to comes to that. But I'll throw to you, Alex, because I've spoken about, you know, the event management type side of things. But are there ways in which venues can can use AI as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the things that we've heard over the last year really has to relate back to um, RFP response times and planners not necessarily getting um, their responses quick enough or frankly, maybe not even getting enough responses as they're evaluating venues. So in some cases, planners have to send out that RFP to an additional four venues just to get bids. Um, in other cases, right, the venue might not have space available. They might not just have time to respond. I really don't think we're too far off from where we're gonna see AI play a much bigger part um, in helping solve these challenges. And so that's one of the things I'm looking forward to most is how can we really embrace AI when it comes to leveraging it um, and, and you know, making sure our lives are much, much easier um, in solving some of the pain points that we have in, in just doing our in our daily jobs. And so with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Mike, who's gonna talk um, about enhanced engagement. All right, thank you both. You're right. This would you cannot have an event trends presentation uh, in the year of 2024 without talking about AI. So, so, so thank you both. All right, and Victoria, I'm going to take a piece out of your playbook. Um, let's go to a quick voice from the industry to help walk us into our next trend. My name's Anna Peters, and I'm the creative director for Evolve Events. In 2024, I predict we will see a return on engagement revolution. Yes, ROI still matters, but there's a shift to a broader approach. Attendees crave events with impact, authenticity and values that align, especially with the rise of AI, making face-to-face -face connections more crucial than ever before. All right, well, we couldn't agree more, which takes us to trend four. Uh, which is reimagining engagement in 2024. Um, look, everything we continue to see says that networking and professional development remain the top reasons for attending an event, especially an in-person event. And so it's probably no surprise that this trend focuses on the shifting engagement patterns and expectations that attendees have when they're coming to your event. Let's take a look at three elements of this real quick. First, on the element of content. Got to go from being talked to to being much more interactive when we're approaching our audiences. Hopefully you see a little bit of that today with the poll questions and the Q&A that we've even got going on in this gathering. But it actually extends beyond just being interactive. It goes right to audience participation, which takes us to this next piece. Increasingly, the time and dollar investment that attendees are, are, are putting out to attend an event has to bring a return on skills. Uh, so more and more, we're seeing skills-based content come to the fore of agendas. At our own Cvent Connect user conference, our hands-on training experiences sold out three times over. We had to introduce double the number of technology tours because people wanted to get their hands on and leave that event with a deeper understanding and a skill that they didn't arrive with. And the first, last one on content is this notion of evergreen. On-demand, time-shifted content is just the attendees' expectations these days. They missed a session because they were double booked at 10 o'clock. They can watch it in their hotel room that night, or they can watch it long after the event ended. Another quick fact at Cvent Connect last year, over 20% of the engagement points with our content happened after the event ended. So there's a 20% long tail in engagement that can happen if that can, content continues to work for you. Second, networking. First thing earlier, make sure that the attendees that are coming have a chance to start connecting with their network and building their network long before the event starts. Second, Put that, make that smarter for them. We just talked about AI. AI can know your title, know your organization, know what sessions you're interested in and registered for. And those pieces of data made available to folks can help them start smartly connecting with others that share similar titles and in similar industries or with similar interests. But the big thing that we see here is just more, more opportunities for networking. 
bring them forward in the agenda, not on the last day, but on day one, so folks can begin to, to assemble their networks and transit through their event experience with a birds of a feather group, instead of just meeting somebody on the party the last day and wishing that they would have been able to connect with them and learn more from them throughout the course of the event. So more in the agenda. The last one is very interesting and it, when it comes to reimagining an engagement. It really is extending that engagement year round. We're seeing some very interesting developments in this space, probably because the event content is such a big investment for most organizations. So there's a trend toward leveraging that event content putting it and hosting it in a digital destination and continuing to drive audiences to that content year round. So they can continue to see the greatest hits from that event. And then we're actually starting to see organizations market and merchandise upcoming events right next to that content. So people can see all the great content and networking options that they're going to have from the past event and start to see how that next event could come into focus for them and actually having them register right from that interface. So just a really interesting uh, developments about taking content and having it work for you and keep audiences engaged year round. So Alex to trend five, back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. So next up, we're going to talk about how technology is uniting venues and planners. So really, there's no secret. Um, we're all embracing these digital tools to help with the sourcing, the booking, and the execution of meetings and events. Venues use these tools to attract, engage, and communicate with planners. And then the planners are using these tools to source, execute, and design those memorable and engaging events like Mike just discussed. So imagine the scenario where a planner, you can't necessarily take that typical site visit, right, due to budget constraints. But you still have those same expectations to deliver that high impact event that's gonna meet your organizational goals. This is really where tech can come into play. So I'd like to just kind of use, use kind of an analogy here. So imagine you're buying a house and, and on Zillow, there's no photos or videos. You're much less likely to add that to the list of properties you need to check out. That same thing really applies when you're looking for a venue for your next meeting or event. In today's world, the expectation is that as a planner, you can research these venues online without ever having to step foot in the venue. You can really visualize that event digitally iterating on the floor plan setups, you know, all online. And then lastly, 3D layouts, right? It's incredible how powerful 3D can be, um, especially when we don't have the luxury of necessarily going to all of these venues um, one by one in person. Tech is really a game changer here when it comes to how planners are working with venues. And it's not possible to execute on these events without that right technology at your disposal. And so now I'll go ahead and pass it over to Victoria, who's going to talk about, excuse me, sustainability. Yes, thanks, Alex. So this trend is sustainability and accessibility. Um, but before we take a look at this one, um, we have another video, um, this time from Stephen Cutchins, who is a senior product manager at Cvent and an expert on the topic of accessibility. So let's take a look. Globally, it's about 16% of the world's population of adult working age, working age adults have a disability, 16%. Um, in the UK, it's about 22, US, it's about 26. So let's say 20% average. So if you look in this room, there's 500 people, we should have 100 people, adults with a disability. It could be minor color vision deficient or colorblind. 8% of men are colorblind. So um, if you look in this room, if there's 100 men, eight of them can't differentiate between say red and green so if we show an error on a page that's in red and a success match is in green they can't tell the difference so little things like that it's easy to fix we just don't use just red we have to use you know we can say red and error they the error and red we preface it with the word error or last name is required or something like that not just the color because we have to make it work for eight percent of the men Yeah, so I think what we got there from Stephen is that, you know, disability affects a huge um, amount of the population and it's um, it's therefore really important um, that accessibility is a fundamental aspect of your event design. So, you know, we can see the, the numbers there of 
you know, 1.3 billion people around the world have some form of disability. So I think when it comes to accessibility in your events, it's really about being intentional from the very start. So for example, you know, during the registration process, are you asking the right questions? Um, things like, you know, do you require captions or a sign language interpreter or wheelchair um, access? You know, and also when it comes to your in-person events, really thinking about that on-site experience. So, you know, things like the agenda, is it inclusive? Um, making sure that the sessions aren't too long and that there are regular breaks for, for people. Um, we had our own Cvent Connect Europe conference in November last year and some of the things that we did to ensure an accessible experience was to have you know British sign language interpreters at all of our sessions we had captions running as well and we you know provided a low sentry room for attendees who needed a moment to to recharge so it's also it's also about you know creating a culture of inclusion so making sure that all the staff that are working at your events are really trained on on the topic and these are all small steps that you can take to really build that accessible event experience. Um, but if we move to you know, sustainability, again, this isn't a new issue. Um, and it's great to see that um, organizations now have net zero goals. Um, we've made great strides as an industry. You know, I think that many of us are on board with you know, reducing um, single use plastic and sourcing locally, but there are still challenges. Um, you know, one interesting piece of research came from the latest ICE benchmarking report for corporate events, and it showed that um, cost was seen as the biggest hurdle to achieving sustainability. 40% um, of res respondents um, cited that as the number one challenge, you know. And there are other challenges, you know, around benchmarking and standardization and having the right metrics to track, even just knowing what, what you should be tracking. Um, but again, as with accessibility, I think here, it's about focusing on the things that you can execute now. So things like going paperless and encouraging your attendees to use an app instead of printed material um, or prioritizing suppliers um, that have a cert sustainability certification. And I think um, coming back you know, to, to the overall trend, it, it said on that side, accessible, sustainable events reflect brand values. And so whilst DE&I, inclusivity, um, sustainability, they're not new topics, what's clear is that consumers and buyers really expect brands to demonstrate their commitment to these social issues. And events are a really clear way for brands to showcase their values and demonstrate that they're practicing what they preach. Um, but Alex, what do you think from a venue perspective, how can venues support um, event teams with this? Yeah, so absolutely. Look, I mean, there's times when planners are specifically seeking out um, venues that do a great job with sustainability, and oftentimes they have to include sustainable venues on an RFP. So as a venue, um, we need to make sure that you guys are doing your part right and sharing out your practices with planners as they're sourcing those venues. It is incredibly competitive to win um, a planner's piece of business. And oftentimes this could be what sets you apart um, to win that business from that planner. So I think it's just really important to make sure that you're sharing out what um, what you're doing at your property to make sure that you're having sustainable events. Um, and that could be a key to winning that piece of business. And so with that, Victoria, I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so excited to go to the next trend now. Um, and this one is a really interesting and ever evolving trend. It's events shifting to marketing. So what does that mean? Um, well, what we've witnessed is a closer alignment between event and marketing teams, as well as a change in re reporting structure. So if we pull up some of the numbers now, um, the latest ICE report shows um, that 71% of event teams now report into marketing. And this is actually up significantly from 55% um, in 2022. So what this trend really highlights is the recognition of events um, as bringing a really um, strategic value um, to overall marketing efforts. And events are really part and parcel of that omni-channel marketing strategy. And, you know, marketing budgets reflect this too. So around 14% of a marketing budget is dedicated to events. Um, so clearly marketers are prioritizing events as a, as a marketing channel um, to help achieve specific goals, whether that's to drive leads or to increase revenue and sales pipeline or build brand awareness. And I think that 
you know, this close collaboration between event and marketing teams is a pretty exciting evolution because for one thing, um, working closer together can lead to more cohesive and impactful brand experiences for attendees. Um, but it's also important to touch on the alignment of, you know, event objectives with overall marketing goals. So here is where um, both teams really need to come together um, to work on developing event programs and content and promotional strategies that target the right audience um, to really drive impact and support those wider organizational goals. And, you know, here at C-Event, we actually attend and host a lot of events. And I know that our meetings and events team um, work really closely with our marketing teams to make sure we're on the same page when it comes to setting KPIs eyes and objectives, um, understanding how we're going to measure ROI and really de designing that overall event experience. You know, ex experiential events are a really important way for, for brands to shine um, in this, you know, crowded landscape. Um, that we're in. And earlier, Alex spoke about technology uniting planners and suppliers. Well, technology can also facilitate that collaboration between event and marketing teams. Um, things like event management software, CRM systems, and marketing automation are all tools that enable better communication, data sharing, and project management. And um, finally, on that point, you know, it's really about making sure you use the data, both teams are using that data um, from these technologies to optimize um, the event strategy and to really track and define that ROI so as to make informed decisions for, for future events. So really, I think this greater synergy between both teams ultimately puts the spotlight back on events as that critical channel to drive impact, not only for, for marketing, but across the, the whole organization really. Um, and with that, let's move on to the next trend, um, which is another exciting one. This is technology is a core skill. So we've talked a lot about technology today and with good reason. Um, it's not because we're a technology provider, I promise. Um, it's because technology really plays a pivotal role in planning and executing an event nowadays. You know, we've seen the rise of virtual and hybrid events since the pandemic. And for a lot of people that meant learning new skills. Um, but also technology helps you capture valuable data from your events which you'll then want to analyze and integrate with your MarTech and other systems. And even when it comes to in-person events, which many of you are planning, as we saw in that poll earlier, um, technology is really important. You know, your attendees are using tools like mobile apps to engage with your event and to network with other attendees. Um, we have new social medias, um, media platforms popping up all the time. Um, and that's, you know, an important channel to promote your events. And video content is definitely a non-negotiable these days. And that requires technology as well. So all of that to say, you know, to really grow in, in your career, it's important not only to be comfortable with technology, but to be able to be proactive in learning and keeping up to date with new um, and emerging technologies as well. And if we um, move to take an example of this um, in action, um, what we're seeing in the market is the rise of this role called, you know, an event technologist. And this is exciting because it's an emerging role. Only about a quarter of organizations have a dedicated event technologist, but most organizations believe it will only become more important over the next few years. And these numbers that you're seeing now um, are based on a study uh, conducted by Hanover Research um, recently. So, you know, what is an te event technologist? Um, whilst the role is still evolving, um, fundamentally, um, the role is really understanding those event management and planning processes, but also having a deep knowledge of technology. So an event technologist may focus on things like managing the event tech stack or finding new and innovative tech solutions to implement at your events, um, monitoring relevant KPIs like app adoption rates or engagement rates, um, for example. And, you know, since events produce such a wealth of data, that is a role that requires the ability to analyze those data points and really bring those um, insights to the wider team to be able to optimize future strategies. Um, but the event technologist is really just one example. Really, this whole trend and topic is about adapting to this digital world that we find ourselves in. And technology is such an intrinsic part of that. You know, earlier we spoke about AI. And that's another um, example of how technology is constantly evolving. And you do need to keep up so as not to be left behind. So 
I would say, you know, experiment, embrace continuous learning, attend training workshops, do all of the necessary things to make sure that you're continuing to build your skill set. Um, and for the leaders who may be watching, you know, building opportunities for training and learning for your teams as well will be really valuable and really um, set you up um, to really stay uh, ahead of the curve. Um, but Alex, what are your thoughts um, on this from a venue perspective? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? So, um, you know, across both sides, right? Staffing challenges remain. Um, planners and hoteliers, they're all expected to do more with less. And we know that the number of events is increasing, right? So. I guess my suggestion here is, you know, as we find, as you find yourself repeating a manual process over and over, really think about how technology can help solve that pain. And with that in mind, really continue to look for those ways, like you mentioned, Victoria, to make yourself more effective and efficient. Um, there are tons of uh, free tools out there that you can really leverage to make your jobs easier. Um, and I encourage you guys to experiment and try um, as many of those as possible, because I mean, at the end of the day, um, we only have so many hours in the day, right? And, and the, the amount of work that we have to do is, is not necessarily slowing down, right? So just keep that in mind in order to, to really improve um, your skill set and then advance your career. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Mike, who's going to talk a little bit about ROI. Okay. Thank you both. Okay. Two more to go. Uh, we got 10 trends. We've got, I'm going to take you through trend nine and trend 10. And maybe other than AI, this one is also probably the least surprising. Uh, this was certainly one of our trends in 2023 as well. Uh, and what is conspiring here are largely the same set of factors we saw in 2023. Um, investment in meetings and events is up. Uh, the deep freeze on budgets is thawing a little bit. Um, but while Budgets are up, let's say, the last I looked at, at some of the Gartner statistics, 29% of B2B marketing program budgets were devoted to meetings and events. So it's great to see that investment. It's great to see that excitement. It's great to see those budgets increase, uh, but costs are increasing too. And so they're almost netting each other out. Um, and we're continuing to face the same macro factors that we did in 2023. Scrutiny of spend on all of our marketing programs a greater push to profitability and growth at any cost just isn't the mantra anymore. And so while it's great that organizations are willing to invest to scale and make things more efficient, just like last year, got to have a clear path to value and adoption and proof of impact. Now to see how that's going to play out in 2024, uh, about a month and a half ago, Cvent working with Forrester, asked hundreds of meeting and event leaders around the globe what they were trying to accomplish in their programs for the next 12 months. Uh, and so this was a commission study that was conducted by Forrester on behalf of CVent. But the next several slides are going to help bring this to life. So what I thought was interesting here is how crystal clear this data makes that trend come to life. There's clearly a growth mindset out there when it comes to the meetings and events channel. Look at these top three responses. They're all what I kind of call hit the gas uh, responses. I want to grow my meetings and events. I need to increase awareness and demand. I need to grow pipeline and revenue. But right on their heels are three clear indicators that we got to be smart. We got to tap the brake a little bit to make sure that the investment that's going into these these programs is paying off is delivering return on on investment and so that takes us to the last trend to shed light on how they're balancing this how are organizations changing what they're doing to be able to scale their program but do it as efficiently as possible and so that last trend is a trend towards centralization. And I'm going to take you through four quick pieces of data from that same Forrester study commissioned by CVent that walks you through how organizations are thinking about what they're doing with their teams and what they're doing with their technology. Okay, let's start with teams. As you can see from this data, most are centralizing event planning. They're centralizing event execution, and they're even centralizing the process of technology selection. They're doing this especially for their larger events. Now, we absolutely see a trend toward for field marketing events, for those smaller, simple events. Those continue to happen outside in the field, 
Um, but especially for these larger events or to get in place core processes, templates, workflows, teams are starting to centralize. They're starting to come together for that reason. Then we asked them, okay, you're bringing your teams together. Why? What's the key driver in the team consolidation? And the answer was pretty unmistakable. Uh, we gave folks a sliding scale. Are you centralizing your teams to grow and hit the gas? Or are you centralizing your teams to be smart? Maybe tap the brake a little bit. And the key leader here was they're centralizing those teams to be more efficient, to save costs, to get standardized processes, event templates, promotion support practices, those gears that can grind if you don't get them right, bringing those teams together, building those best practices and pushing those out across the rest of the organization. So that's what they're doing on the team's side. On the technology side, they're moving to consolidate and centralize their tech stack. 75% of the people of the organizations that are centralizing their teams said it was important and critical to consolidate their tech. Probably no big surprise there. They're already an organization that is looking to centralize and consolidate. But if you look at that 77 stat in the green box on the right, even those organizations that aren't bringing their teams together in a central center of excellence, they're still centralizing around their tech. So regardless of how their teams are oriented, that centralized tech stack is still something that they're looking at to be able to increase results and improve results. And they're doing that. Remember, we talked about they're scaling, they're centralizing teams for, for, for efficiency. They're centralizing tech for scale and evidence of impact. We talked about ROI. I'm willing to make the investment, but I've got to have demonstrable proof of impact. And so on the tech side, they're bringing that technology together to help them do more with less and then ultimately to be able to prove the impact of that spend and prove the impact of their events. So centralization and that consolidation force of gravity is something that we see continuing in the industry this year. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the prepared remarks. Um, what I wanted to just say, you all will have access to this presentation. We know we've covered a lot. So we wanted to just give you a quick cheat sheet so you will find in the presentation this final cheat sheet that summarizes the, the trends that we talked about uh, and a little bit of the so what, the implication of that that, uh, that we see. Okay, so before we get to questions, open that up in, in, in one minute. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your time and attention. I know you all are very busy people. Thanks for, for listening in. Um, if all you wanted today was to take uh, a, a glimpse of the trends and core things and what's going on in the marketplace, wonderful, thank you. If anything that we covered today piques your interest, you'd like to know a little bit more, want to see about how technology can bring that to life, or maybe understand a little bit more about the system that generated a lot of this these trends today. Um, if you'd like, you can earn a $100 Amazon gift card for attending a demo with us, if you're interested. Um, so just fill out the form on our gifting page. We'll drop that link in the chat. Fill that out. We'd love to talk to you, answer any more questions, and maybe give you some we're seeing today. Okay. And with that, um, let's look at some of the questions that you all had. Um, thank you all for, for bringing those up. Thanks for your interactivity. I'm calling those out. Hey, Alex and Victoria, welcome back. All right, starting with the top one. This is the most upvoted question. I don't know a ton about AI, and the only tool I know of is ChatGPT, which I have used for social media posts. What are some other good AI tools to use? I can take that one. And I think that's a great question and one that comes up quite frequently. And I would say it really depends on what you're looking to do. So from the question, it looks like it's geared towards more content creation. And there are a lot of tools out there aside from um, ChatGPT. You know, Jasper, um, the AI is one. It's very much used by a lot of marketers to produce, you know, social media content and blog posts and things like that. 
Um, we have uh, a, a lot of AI um, tools coming up in our roadmap. We have our writing assistant, which also helps with um, creating that event content um, and really being able to change the, the tone of voice um, based on, on your guidelines. But aside from you know the, the content creation side of things, there are AI tools that can really help you on your day-to-day -day, um, processes. So tools like otter.ai help with like transcription. Um, so you know the, it really helps to transcribe um, meetings or recordings that you may have and or it might be a video that you have from your event and you want to transcribe that and turn it into um, written content so there are a lot of tools out there to, to help with that but I would say instead of you know naming a lot of, of tools because there are so many out there I think it's really about identifying you know your use case what is the pain point that you are experiencing right now and then looking for solutions that can help with that and I would recommend if you know if you're on at the start of that journey, really um, trying one tool at a time because it can be overwhelming. Um, there are so many AI tools out there, like I was saying. So um, I would say to test one tool at a time and also know their limitations. You know, a tool like ChatGPT can help with content, but it's not the best tool if you're looking for research, for example. Um, so I would say, um, just to summarize, you know, understand what your pain point is, what, what are you trying to optimize or make more efficient, um, and then find um, solutions that can help with that, test them, do demos um, to really see if, if it's your needs, um, and also understand the pros and cons of, of using them. So that would be my advice um, with that question. Great. Okay, let's go to the next one. Next top voted question is really around engagement and technology. So the question is, what suggestions might you have for incorporating more tech engagement into events when this tends to be a big budget item? Budgets continue to decrease. Um, I'll start with this and then Alex or Victoria, if you have anything to add, I'll, I'll tell you a, a couple ways to get started here. First, from an on-site engagement perspective, probably the first thing I would go to is, is making sure that mobile event app, that engagement in the palm of somebody's hand is something that you're planning for and you're using. Um, these can be great tools to meet attendees. These can be great tools to do chat, Q&A. A lot of the functions that we did today and on this webinar can be on the, on the mobile app to increase gamification and can, and can increase um, that type of interactive experience that constantly brings people back into your branded technology asset and gets them interacting with content, with speakers, with other attendees. It's also doubles as a great source of, of information. The other thing that I would point to just from a tech engagement perspective, and I'll go back to our Cvent Connect example. I mentioned earlier that 20% of our engagement measurable engagement points with our audience at Connect. This is a three-day, 4,000-person user conference. 20% um, of those engagement points happened after the event was over. 20% happened before the event started. So tools like the, the app, tools like making sure that those sessions and content and teaser videos and things are available in a digital destination that describes your event before that event even starts, that gets the engagement motion started um, and is a great way to get people interested and primed for the event. So two just quick things that you could start start with. Yeah, jump, jumping in on that, Mike, um, when we when we think about Cvent Connect, one of the things that we really look to do, um, I, and I handle a lot of the sponsor and exhibitors that come um, from the hotel side, is you got to start early, right? You need, need to make sure people are adopting those tools well in advance of the event. Um, and then that way, that really helps foster that engagement by the time they get to um, the site of that, that event. So I, I just encourage people to really leverage that technology months and weeks leading up to the event to make sure people are all set when they do get on site. Um, and that can really help with the engagement and connecting your attendees um, together um, once you're on site. Great. And, and Alex, maybe if I can stay with you for a second, because the next question that was just on the heels of that was, Okay, when do you recommend opening up that mobile app? Um, yeah, so, how do you encourage people to start networking through that? So do you, do you open it up the day before, a month before? Yeah. So um, it, it's interesting. So with Cvent Connect, we kind of have what we call Attendee Hub, which is our, our overall event hub, um, where people can log in, they can build their profile, they can view the content. 
that usually um, they can add sessions to their agenda, right? That usually launches a couple months before the event. Now, this is a large event with thousands and thousands of people. Not necessarily, you know, sure you have to do that necessarily for a smaller event that far out. Um, for the mobile app, we've seen success launching that two, three, four weeks out in advance, right? Um, and, and honestly, our download rates, I mean, it's something that we really focus on. We really look to drive adoption of that. Um, and it's something that we're constantly checking in on because we want everyone to have that event app before they're really checking in. Um, and so, Mike, generally speaking for that, it's usually two, three, four weeks out. Great. Okay. Um, let's go to the next one, um, which, which hurts my heart a little bit, I got to say. Um, the next question is, we have reduced our marketing staff by 20% and cannot support the huge trade shows that sales wants us to go to with a booth. Booths are expensive. Um, what are other alternatives for engagement besides a booth? So I've got a couple thoughts, but Alex or Victoria, anything that immediately springs to mind? Okay. Anything on your I can go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. And yeah, I've got so yeah, so, um, you know, you don't always need to have the, t the 10 by 10 custom booth. Um, I think that's that's important. And so in many cases, it can be even much larger. Um, so what we what we've really looked to do, right, like depending on the type of event is what are your overall goals and outcomes um, that you're looking to get from that event? And then ultimately, how can you leverage that event as a launch pad? Rather, you know, maybe it makes more sense to have meetings at the Starbucks, which might right be, might be right next to the convention center, right? So you still want your attendees to go. You just can't necessarily have that big physical presence, but there are still tons of opportunities that you can really leverage um, with your sales staff there um, to get the most out of that event. Yeah, exactly. Because look, I, our sales team is the same the same way. Uh, they want us to go to a lot of trade shows. And what they're really wanting there, they're wanting the awareness and they're wanting the leads that, that, that trade shows can, can provide. Um, so Alex, completely agree. Um, the only thing I might add there is, yeah, maybe there's an activation outside of an expensive booth um, that you can that you can do, uh, because a lot of that is, can you do smart appointment setting before you even get on site? You're not relying on your booth to generate that traffic. You're not relying on the booth to generate that awareness, but you've been smart about knowing who's coming and trying to set those preset those appointments. The, the other thing that we do sometimes is we partner on activations. Um, it can be an interesting way to um, to be able to maybe partner with somebody else that's there, another provider in the adjacent space that's there, so you're not competitive, um, but be able to to attend and split the costs a little bit by uh, through either through an activation or through a joint presence. Um, one of the other things that you can do um, is I, nothing replaces a booth as that center of, uh, of gravity for your brand and, and for leads. Um, but make sure you're watching the content published schedules. And if there's a call for papers, if there's a, if, if somebody has put out something that says, Hey, we're looking for, for, um, ideas to speak, um, in, in some of the trade shows we attend, we'll actually make sure that we're on top of that, submit a really interesting on topic. Um, presentation. And then while we don't have a booth, we have a presence there and the ability to talk to a captive audience about uh, the, the world as we see it. Okay. I think we have room for one more. Um, what are the first three aspects of event tech that can be used on an event which have the least impact on workload, but maximize output for delegates and enhanced event experience? Love this question. So Victoria and Alex, if I'm, if I'm understanding this right, I'm gonna let you guys read it too. This is what are the three pieces of event tech that can really give me leverage because I got way too much on my plate. Mm. Uh, any immediate thoughts come to mind? I've got, a, I've got a few, but that are both saving free people time and having a lot of impact. It's what you have to say, Mike, it would be so the, the first one is I just see our planning team and how they struggle with venue sourcing and venue selection. So I think the first thing that comes to mind is being smart um, about the technology they can use to save you a ton of time and heartache around selecting the right venue, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a unique venue. Um, technology can help you sort through quickly an ocean's worth of possibilities create one RFP, send to many, 
instantly understand availability and costs that meet your criteria. So that would be the first thing that I would point. I'm just going through the event life cycle in my head and starting at the beginning of that venue sourcing and selection process. Technology can really help there. Um, Alex or Victoria? Uh, yeah, I, just, two, just, on the, just on that note too, right? Like we talked a little bit about it beforehand. You don't necessarily have the budget or the time, frankly, to go and do all of these site visits. So make sure you're you're leveraging, you know, the websites, right? Make sure you're checking out what the rooms look like in 3D. Um, it's certainly not going to replace being in person, but in terms of you know cost savings and time crunch, it is an incredible research uh, resource to really be able to leverage those tools online. Um, the, the the other one that comes to mind from an, a, an effort and return on attendee experience is that mobile app and because and because i do think it gives you a lot of tools first it can be really easy to set up a mobile app now i know alex you mentioned the attendee hub the attendee hub lets you build that event and you instantly have a native app at representation of it that gives you attendee engagement possibilities that gives you the ability to publish into that event app with current with current important new information um, it gives it can let you continue to give notifications out to your audience. Don't forget about this networking happy hour. Don't forget about the general session that's happening right now. It's a wonderful multi-purpose tool. It's actually pretty easy to set up that delivers a lot of engagement and information quickly. So low level of lift for you, high attendee engagement return for you. I agree with that, Mike, and I think attendees now come to expect that as well at, at events you know they want to be able to understand what's coming up you know at the show what can i look forward to as you mentioned you know the notifications um that sort of thing but also it also provides you with that data to be able to know how people are interacting with those elements of your events you know um as mike was saying you know some multi-purpose tool so if you have polls and surveys and things like that through um your app um it, it's not only about the engagement that you get from it, but also the insights that you get on the back end as well. So fantastic. Okay. Well, I know that we are coming up to time. Um, so first, Alex and Victoria, thank you. Um, but also wanted to thank all of you that joined us today. Again, know that you are all very busy, uh, very busy people spend uh, really appreciate you taking an hour out of your day uh, to spend with us. Um, and so with that, Thank you all. Um, hoping you have a great 2024 and uh, your meetings and events programs kill it. Thanks everybody.